Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. One of the world's most colorful seabirds is the Atlantic puffin, which used to inhabit a great many islands from Maine northward through the Maritimes. These elegant 10-inch high birds, which raise their young in burrows, breed slowly and have largely been exterminated in much of their former range. A project is now in progress to attempt to increase their population and extend their range back to islands where they once lived. In order to do that, puffin chicks on Great Island, here off the coast of Newfoundland near St. John's, are being removed from the nesting burrows and taken to eastern Egg Rock Island off the coast of Maine, hopefully to establish new colonies. Recently, we were invited to observe the work being done by scientists in this project of the National Audubon Society. To understand what sort of conditions the transplanted puffin chicks require, we went first to an island similar to Eastern Egg Rock Island, located here, not far from Maine, where puffins still breed and can be studied closely. It is called Machaya Seal Island. Here on Machaya Seal Island, Atlantic puffins, terns, and gulls live in natural conditions and provide important information on puffin relocation. Hi, Steve. Hi, Marlon. The puffin project leader is an ornithologist with the National Audubon Society, Dr. Stephen Kress who is also a research affiliate of Cornell University, Laboratory of Ornithology. Machaya Seal Island is ideal for our project study. It not only has breeding puffins, but the topography, habitat, and breeding conditions are quite similar to that island off the main coast where we're attempting to reintroduce the puffins. Here we are studying the natural interrelationships of the seabirds. In order to learn how best to protect the chicks, we are relocating until they become self-sufficient. The puffins here on Machias are at the height of their nesting activities. Let's go. From this blind, we will be able to observe the puffin activities without frightening them. The birds are accustomed to this structure and don't seem to mind faces peering out of the windows. Here on Machias, the puffins nest in crevices of these rocks. Also called sea parrots due to their shape, they live in close association with one another in nesting colonies. Right now, they're in the midst of their breeding activities here. The most distinctive feature of their breeding condition is the remarkably colorful triangular beak. During their season of mating and nesting, head flicking like this is a social greeting, usually between mated pairs. A behavior called billing strengthens bonds and may help keep mated pairs together for life. Historically, puffins were eliminated from many nesting colonies by overhunting in the 1800s. Though relatively abundant here, their natural repopulation of former breeding islands is unlikely in view of their present worldwide state of decline, and also because puffins usually return to breed where they were hatched. Puffin population declines are sometimes traceable to the natural predations of gulls, such as these great blackback gulls. Such gulls frequently invade puffin nests to feed on eggs and chicks. Their depredations are often controlled naturally by another of the seabird species that nest here in considerable numbers. Highly maneuverable in its flight and very excitable in its manner, this is one of the tern species, the Arctic tern. This particular species also nests in colonies. Their nests are often on the exposed ground surface, adjacent to where the rock crevice nesting sites of the puffins occur. These arctic terns are fierce defenders of their nests. They consider most galls, such as the herring gall, to be enemies. 
Even laughing gulls will be attacked if they come near the nesting area of the terns, although they're not normally predatory on nests. The terns have been successful in the defense of their territory and now can resume the feeding of their young. Normally, the fish provided for their chicks is herring. But sometimes, the usual fishing areas are depleted by commercial fishing or natural causes. When herring are not available, they may bring back other species for their chicks, such as the dollar fish. Because these fish are often too large to be swallowed, it could result in the chick's death through starvation or strangulation. In this case, from the actions of the young bird, it appears that the little turn chick is managing to get the dollar fish swallowed. Because the young are so vigorously protected by the adult terns, these birds inadvertently give a certain degree of protection to the puffins who also nest nearby. The puffin is an excellent provider of fish for its young, but it is not noted for its defense of its chicks or eggs from galls. That's important knowledge because re-establishing puffins also means re-establishing terns to help defend against predatory galls. This relationship became apparent to us early in our research into the problems of puffin relocation. And so now the knowledge is being put to good use where the chicks are being relocated, as we'll see later on. But at the moment, we're going to an island off Newfoundland's coast, where another vital aspect of the puffin relocation project is occurring. Dr. Stephen Kress and I went from Machaya Seal Island to Newfoundland's Great Island to meet the other half of the scientific team working on puffin reestablishment. This island provides ideal habitat for many seabirds. The kittiwakes especially favor austere cliffs, pockmarked with crannies as nesting sites. Here, they are relatively safe from the nest depredations of their enemies. The seabird life supported by this habitat is what makes the mile-long island so valuable. While Stephen Kress works for the Audubon Society, the project is also sponsored by the Canadian Wildlife Service, represented here by Dr. Kress's scientific colleague. Steve Kress and I are now on Great Island, where we have joined the man who is one of the foremost authorities on puffins in North America, and perhaps in the whole world. A research biologist with the Canadian Wildlife Service, he is Dr. David Nettleship. In this present Atlantic puffin relocation project, we're engaged in something of a race against time. Everywhere throughout their world range, puffins are declining. The birds at Great Island and the rest of Witless Bay comprise 75% of the North American population. If we can't identify their ecological requirements and prevent these requirements from being altered by human activities, eventual extinction becomes a real possibility. One phase in prevention of extinction by man-induced activities is relocation of puffin chicks. We are collecting the chicks not far from here. Let's go. Since Great Island supports so many of the North American puffins, our removing selected chicks for relocation to where they are absent will not materially harm the population here. The majority of puffin nesting occurs on the rather steep grassy slopes in burrows the puffins themselves have dug. Here's where we've been gathering some chicks from a series of close together burrows. Most of these burrows run in at a very gentle angle, and frequently the nest inside is beyond arm's reach. 
When we encounter that situation, we simply have to try another burrow. For the most part, our relocation program has dealt with fairly young chicks. It is most ideal to relocate the chick before it learns the great island is where it hatched. The bright colors of beak and feet won't appear until the chick is two years old. Within 20 days after hatching, the flight feathers will begin to show. By 45 days, it will be fully feathered and capable of flight. The measurements we take of the wing are to estimate age. Here it's 35 millimeters, meaning about 10 days old. These data are carefully logged for future reference and study. The relocation boxes are designed with burlap doors through which air can freely pass. Inside, there are rows of cylinders, each compartment holding a chick and keeping it safe from unnecessary jostling until it reaches its new home about a thousand miles away from this island. While we continue the work here, this is a good opportunity for Marlin to get a closer look at puffin nesting activities. The nesting burrows of the puffins are used year after year by the same birds. Wherever there are grassy areas close to the cliffs, that's where puffins nest, even if the grass is on very steep slopes. Each seabird species has its own nesting habitat, so there is little competition among them in this respect. In flight, puffins are not outstandingly graceful, but they are really very strong flyers, sometimes going 200 miles round trip from their nesting colony to find food. At nesting time, the herring gulls keep watch for puffins that have returned with fish held in the bills, since such food can sometimes be stolen. A gull trying to steal a puffin's catch will attack as a puffin enters its burrow and is most vulnerable. But often the gull waits for a hungry puffin chick to approach the burrow's mouth. Slightly off to one side, a puffin witnesses a common tragedy in the nesting colony. A herring gull has killed a chick. While this sort of predation by gulls is natural, there are other significant reasons for puffin population declines, such as oil spills, pesticides, chemical pollution, and commercial overfishing of the puffin's food supply. The work being done by Dr. Nettleship and Dr. Cress of gathering suitable puffin chicks in this particular area is completed for this year. During my absence, the two scientists have finished their collection of chicks. This brings the total of the chicks collected for this year's relocation to 100, which is the annual project quota. Stephen Cress and I will take these collected chicks and move them as quickly as possible to their new home. In our absence, Dr. Nettleship will continue with other research work here. A boat takes us to the mainland, and upon our arrival there, the precious cargo is loaded for its thousand-mile trip to Maine. Another principal phase of the project begins now. Speed is of the essence in relocation of the puffin chicks, and no time was lost getting them to eastern Egg Rock Island. Our flight to coastal Maine took seven hours.
After landing in Maine, we took the chicks by boat to their new home, the Audubon Society's Alan D. Cruikshank Wildlife Sanctuary. Here, various areas like this have been specially constructed to form artificial burrows for the chicks. With us is Tom Fleischner, who is a field biologist working with Dr. Kress. We have thus far in our program relocated 530 puffin chicks like this. When the puffin leaves its own artificial burrow, it spends two years at sea before returning. Part of Tom's job is to see that two daily feedings of smelt are provided to each of the relocated puffins. To aid the chick's growth and health, the fish have been fortified with vitamins. Until the chicks are acclimated to the new burrow, they are kept inside with a hardware cloth screening. After that, the puffin chicks may come out of their burrows any time they care to. That also helps them get accustomed to this island. This is the project's field station where I'll be able to observe another interesting facet of the program. This man painting some puffin decoys is Rick Podolsky, who is another seabird biologist. The puffin decoys being made have a very important purpose. They are used to give a relocated puffin returning after two years absence the sense that adults are already here, as would naturally be the case. If on its first return here, the young puffin were to find no other puffins visible on the rocks, it might not have the confidence to land or stay. Here, near a small blind, decoys have already been positioned on the rocks. It's remarkable how lifelike they appear when set in place, especially when viewed from a little distance. Rich is going back to the station to work on more decoys, and I'll remain here to see if those in place do what they're supposed to do. The sight of a tern flying nearby is important. Terns play a key role in the project, according to Dr. Kress. Some recent developments here are encouraging, and part of this has been due not only to the use of puffin decoys, but to the use of arctic tern decoys as well. Their purpose is to attract the terns, which are an integral part of the process. We've paid close attention to their role in nature and how it can be utilized here. Years ago, the terns were decimated for the millinery trade, and afterwards they avoided this island. Now, our decoys have attracted them again. What's important is that those that have been attracted by the decoys to land on eastern egg rock again are exhibiting courtship behavior rituals, indicating they may be favorably inclined to resume their long-abandoned nesting here. That could be crucial to the project. Since the terns nest in conjunction with the puffins and would drive away any predatory galls, their presence would act as a protective blanket and be a great asset to the relocation project. Once in a while we find that other species of seabirds come in, though not necessarily because they've been attracted by the puffin decoys. This cormorant, casually preening itself, hardly an arm's length from the decoys, represents no real threat to either puffins or terns. There is this year's first puffin return. It's one of our birds that was raised and released here. We've had as many as 14 return here at once. After two years at sea, this puffin seems hungry for companionship. We expect others soon, and if they arrive, this puffin and the decoys will encourage them to land and remain here.
We can tell this is a two-year-old by the leg bands which we attached. Among those yet to return will be some that are now four years old and could conceivably begin breeding here next year. The value of increasing the number of puffin colonies is so that not all the puffins congregate in one place in case a tragedy like an oil spill should occur at some future time. Even though it is still much too early to proclaim the Atlantic Puffin Relocation Project a success, there is a strong feeling of optimism about it at this point. The process of re-establishing Atlantic Puffins is difficult and time-consuming, but we've just witnessed the reward. A banded puffin transplanted here as a chick has come back after its two-year absence at sea. That means the project is working. Perhaps in years to come, a true breeding colony will be re-established here on Eastern Egg Rock. Whether or not man will be able to reverse the damage he has done to the population of Atlantic puffins is not yet known, but certainly he is trying. Without such effort by concerned agencies, it is almost a foregone conclusion that puffins would disappear in these areas forever. That would indeed be a tragedy. Transplantation is not alone the answer. Puffins are affected by what affects their food supply, especially the pollution of our seas and decrease of their food by man's overextensive fishing. Because of the work of dedicated scientists like Dr. Stephen Kress and David Nettleship, who are trying desperately to improve the puffin's lot, early results are very promising. It would be a poorer and less colorful world indeed if the beautiful little puffin were ever to become extinct from the wild kingdom.